after 9-11, the U.S. media completely capitulated and became uh, essentially a, a public relations firm for U.S. White House policy in Iraq. Canadian media was a little better on Iraq because we stayed out of it, uh, but I don't think we have been a heck of a lot better when it comes to Afghanistan. Once the troops are over, the patriotic drums start beating and the media goes along with it. What we saw happening in the U.S., which was the, uh, not just the capitulation of the media, but with the Patriot Act and with the kind of uh, chauvinist fervor that was taking place in the U.S. and the, the attack on people's democratic rights and, and the, uh, the whole Bush-Cheney neocon policy of, you know, how many people here are familiar with the document called Project for New American Century? It began out of a as a letter to Clinton in the late 90s. And then they created this programmatic document, they being Cheney and Wolfowitz, and uh, I think Norman Potteritz is one of the fathers of neoconservatism, uh, Rumsfeld, the whole gang that came to power with Bush and some others. And the, the basic thesis of this document was that we're now living in a one superpower world, and we don't have to abide by the norms that existed post-World War II. In other words, International law no longer matters because international law was part of a contention with another superpower. You made use of this law to kind of control and propagandize against each other. But now that we're one superpower, you don't need international law, which is why you can have preemptive war in Iraq, which everyone knows violated every norm of international law. The second thing was, and this is a very important part, which was that because we're in a one superpower world, we should now project U.S. military power to shape the world as we think it should be. So in other words, you no longer have to use policy of containment against your regimes you don't like. You should go have regime change. So this is all 1999. And for those of you that follow the conspiracy stuff on the internet, one of the famous quotes is from this document. Because in this document, they actually say, we won't be able to really get the American people behind this unless we have another Pearl Harbor. And of course, when 9-11 came, everyone connected these two dots. Now, I'm not saying one and one equals two, but still, it was convenient. The Real News Project began as, an, as that we have to do something about the state of media, starting with the U.S., in the sense that that's, if, if the U.S. descends into, uh, I mean, I think between 9-11 and Katrina, when the media finally got a little bit of guts and started to critique Bush, you, you had a, a, a vision of what a kind of tyranny would look like in the United States. Uh, this kind of alliance between um, neoconservatism, corporatism, and religious evangelicalism. Between that period, you, I think you saw the seeds, and, and it's certainly not gone when you take a look at what's happening with uh, the kind of promotion of Sarah Palin and the kind of movement around Palin-type politics. So the Real News Project said, well, look, if you look at what's really at the heart of what's wrong with, with mainstream news, it's, it's two basic things. Number one, the way the economics of news is based on, first of all, advertising, profit motive, uh, the, the problem of monopoly ownership of media. It creates an agenda. So we, want, we said with the internet, there's now the possibility of changing the economics of television news. That if millions, of, if you could fund a news network the way Obama funded much of his election campaign, you could have a global independent news network. And the finish is number two, which is the biggest deception, I think, of mainstream news. And this goes for television and newspapers. But the number one at the very heart of the deception or the mythology is they report as if we don't live in a class society. I think it's absolutely the heart of the problem. Everyone knows we do. Every reporter knows we do. Everyone they report on knows we do. In fact, when Obama ran his campaign, it was all about we're for the middle class. Well, how can you have the middle class if you don't have some other classes? They don't talk about them. And the same thing happens in Canada. You know, During election times, you hear all kinds of talk about the middle class. But if you have a middle class, you also have an elite. You know, however you want to describe that elite, you have to have one or you don't have the middle. And everyone that does news knows that every story you approach, you have to decide where's your starting point, who's your audience, who you speak to. And the people who are most honest about this are people that report for the business press. 
to some extent, the National Post, a little bit the Globe and Mail, but even more honest are, say, Wall Street Journal or some of the more other financial papers. What's honest about them is they know their audience are, 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 is, a very, uh, is, a, is a section of the elite that has the most capital. And they write for them. And they try to write it more or less as realistically as they can for them. But there's no independent journalism who says straightforwardly, we're not going to report or side with or be appendage of one section of the elite or the other. Because what, what's called diversity of opinion here is diversity of opinion amongst the elite. Because there are very competing interests amongst the elite. But if you try to say, OK, well, we want to represent what's in the interest of workers, well, then you're marginalized, you're utopian, you're naive, you're, you're lefty, you're this or you're that. So the real news says unabashedly, we're not an appendage of any section of the elite. And there's a wonderful quote from George Will uh, in the American elections, which uh, if people that watch the real news know I, I quote this over and over again, and, and I probably will until this isn't true. The Sunday morning on the George Stephanopoulos show, uh, they're, they're having a debate during the election campaign, and Donna Brazil is saying that McCain has seven houses. And they're going on and on about how could, why should people support McCain when he has seven houses. And George Will, if people don't know, he's a right wing, uh, very well known right wing columnist. And then he said, he's getting angry. He's getting redder and redder in the face. And he, then he finally he loses it. And he says, look, everyone that's run for president in the United States is essentially from the American aristocracy. The actual quote is he says, let's not get sentimental about all of this. What you get to, to decide in elections is not whether the elite's going to rule, but which section of the elite's going to rule. Now, he says this on, you know, he would never say it if he wasn't so angry at Donna Brazil, because they don't usually talk so honestly about, about this. What we don't have is a, is a news organization that can do daily television news that's not an appendage representative of one section of the elite or the other. And that's what we're trying to do. I guess I was a little blown away by the professionalism of this news and how I, but I've never heard of it before. I, if I had known, I'd be watching this every morning as at getting my news instead of going to FARC.com because that's the best I can do to get, you know, an unbiased look at what's going on in the world. So I, I just kind of want to know what are you doing to spread the news? Clearly not enough. We're still really small and not nearly yet financed at the level we need to be. In the short term, we're creating a group of volunteers. We're up to, I think, about 40, but we want to get it to like four or 500, who every morning will go blog about us, get onto websites, post our videos, make use of all the social media to start making a lot more noise. The other major thing we're doing is we're making a big push to try to get on television this year. The thing is, for ordinary people right now, it's still more about television, especially when it comes to video, and partly because of how lousy so much of the broadband still is. You, you need a good speed to watch at what feels like a TV experience. And then the other thing is we need more, you know, we need help. We need people to, to let people know. We're doing daily news in the sense that we do a news story every day since the spring of 2007. So we've done, I think we're up to about 4,500 stories now. We're, we want that to flesh out into a full 24-7 network. What you said about the, the presidency in the United States and how they all come from a, an elitist area really hit home with me. Um, I guess my question is, uh, where, what section of that do you see Obama representing? And, and what section of that do we need to be supporting in order to push a more left-wing uh, you know, ideals? That's the question. Really. I mean, in terms of working people, that is the question. Um, if you go back to that quote from George Will, what you do is you get a choice between these two sections of the elites. It's really a question for the unions. I'm firmly of the belief that the only possibility of a people's movement in North America is going to come out of unions. It's not coming out of anywhere else. It's not come out of a peace movement. And uh, it's not, you know, civil rights movement had a lot of heat behind it, but it it had modest, modest objectives. It kind of achieved some of them. But it's not going to create this, ma this kind of change that people want. It's going, to, it's going to be a come out of the unions, which means it's going to have to be a big fight in the unions. Almost all of the unions' participation in politics in Canada and the US is simply to be an appendage of one section of the elite or another. 
so you've raised the question of how do you have uh, independent people's politics, working class politics, and participate in elite politics, because you actually have to do both. Because right now there is no party that you could say really represents working people that has a chance of winning right now. And you can't ignore that right now. There's some things that you need to do. At least what we have to do now is journalists, because that's what I can speak about. And I, but I think it's the same thing for you as activists and trade unions. Make sure that people don't have illusions when you say, OK, maybe Obama is better than Bush, but don't have any illusion that Obama is a, is a creation of Wall Street, because he is. I mean, everybody that studies where Obama money came from, it's no surprise that he did what he did in terms of the financial bail, bailout. He's been uh, mostly a, a, a manufactured personality uh, by Wall Street money from the beginning. Now, this isn't to say he isn't significantly better and different than the Bush guys, because he's rational so far. Where the other guys, I really, I, I don't think we should discount the psychological piece of this. These other guys are sociopaths. And this, they will turn into the kind of, some form of a kind of neo-fascism if they ever have a chance to. But people shouldn't have illusions. So like before the American elections, we interviewed Chomsky and Zinn, and they both said more or less the same thing. They said, vote for Obama, but don't have any illusions about Obama. We have a message that we need to get out. We, we, we have challenges communicating with our 160,000 members, and more especially, communicating with the Canadian public. So I see a, a, a partnership type of thing where, you know, like we let you, we get you into our organization, we get our message out, you interview us. I try to get interviewed on, 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 the, on the citizen or, you know, or they, they don't return my calls, you know, stuff like that. So I'm not getting that exposure. I need to get that exposure. But I think that it goes, I think that that pro probably applies to all of my sisters and brothers here. There's no journalism without being on one side of the barricades or the other. Like you're either kind of with the elite or you're not. That being said, and we've said clearly, we're not going to you know, side with one side of the elite or the other. We're going to do, we're, our phrase is, we're going to do news with ordinary people's interests in mind. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to be propagandists for anybody. Because I think it's in the interests of working people that they have journalists who will, act, who will go after the truth and the facts, no matter what, who it hurts or helps and wherever the chips fall. You know, in the United States, after 9-11, the president of the machinist union came out and said, we want revenge, pure and simple, calling for an attack on Afghanistan. And how many of his members are you know, working in military production? Um, so we'll say that. Uh, and, and and, and one thing we will do, and we really want to find the resources for this, we want to report on the fight that's going on in the unions. Because I think it's probably, from any objective news point of view, like if you came from outer space and just said, what's really newsworthy, if you really understand the society, I think you'd actually say the fight going on in the unions is maybe the most newsworthy thing happening in North America. Is there going to be a fight against conservatism in the unions? Are, you know, is there going to be a progressive force that takes on the right wing of the union movement. It, that's a story I want to cover all the time. And we'll cover it fairly. Like, but what you choose to be a story says a lot. So yeah, we want financial support. We, 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 CAW gave us a pretty generous donation when we first got started. We haven't done anything to pay it back, in a sense. Like We don't go out and you know, try to stroke the CAW. Uh, we've done stories that are about CAW strike struggles, and we've done others. So the answer is yeah, but know what you're getting when you get us. Where are you now in terms of, of uh, where you need to be, I guess, in the future? Like how many uh, subscribers do you have? How many do you need before you can be at that place you want to be? Right now we're at a model we more or less sustain, which is essentially one story a day. What Angela said right off the top, which is, why don't more people know about us? We don't have a PR budget. We spend now about $60,000 a month, which compares to, I don't know, the toilet paper budget of CNN. 
to do um, a television model or an internet news model that would be more like television, we should be about three times where we are. Uh, what we need to do is kind of consolidate where we are right now. Like a full TV budget would probably be, be in the range of about six to eight million a year. And that would, we could do a 24-7, modest 24-7 uh, show with that. We, we just negotiated a deal with Al Jazeera. We think we can do something similar with some of the others, ones like France 24. There's, to get some international coverage, we can make deals which for practically for free. What we want to do is we want to have a flagship debate show, like we used to have with Counterspin. We want to have a flagship news show. Our budget's about 60000 a month. We raise about 20000 of that through small donors, five, ten, twenty dollar donors. So it's like 20 grand a month. So 40 grand a month is coming from bigger donors. And it's kind of, mostly it's people that just found us over the internet. Like there's one guy who, who inherited some money and he didn't want to touch it because he's quite progressive politically. So he figured he should earn his own living and he didn't know what to do with what he inherited. So he started giving it away to things he liked. So he gives us a chunk of money. So there's little bits and things we scramble around for. To be sustainable, we need like 5,000 people at 10 bucks a month. It's not that big a number, really. That would, that would consolidate where we are now. The ideal situation is something like 250,000 people. You know, if you just, just look at Canadian union membership alone, you know, if you could get, what, five, six percent of union members in Canada doing 10 bucks a month, we're practically sustainable just on that basis alone. The other big thing we really want to take up, and I would say the most important thing we want to deal with, other than stories like this, is we, want to, we really want to talk about, we want everybody to become economists. Everybody should understand why the economic crisis is happening, and we want to try to answer two questions. Why is this happening to me, and what can I do about it? People need to understand what the shenanigans on Wall Street are, but I think the most important thing people have to understand is, and of course this is a debate and we will also express the debate, but my opinion after talking to many, many economists, the root of all of this is low wages. I mean, it's just this enormous transfer of wealth. Uh, you don't have real purchasing power in the society and you can stimulate all you want and you can f and you financially regulate and everything else. But if they don't, if the issue of, like this is what's wrong with how they, I think how they're waging the strike in uh, Sudbury. This goes back to how do people in unions communicate better to the media. Unions need to, I think, vigorously fight that the solution to the economic crisis is higher wages. Because in fact what's happening now, like when you go talk to community people in, in Sudbury, or we've done stories from Windsor and Detroit, from non-unionized workers, the resentment against unionized workers, how much you hear you guys are paid too much. You're causing the problem. You're making us uncompetitive with workers in other parts of the world. What's wrong with, what do you need a nickel bonus for? You're making 25 bucks an hour. I mean, the resentment, and people, people just, and, and when you hear e economics debated and talked about in mainstream television or media or anywhere, you know, it's all from the point of view of investors. So of course, low wages is, is good, and they never, even, they never even discuss the issue of wages. But forget any morality of it. If you actually wanted to solve the economic crisis, I mean, other than taxing wealth, the real ongoing sustainable model is people have to get paid properly, and then some. I mean, you can go further than that, but that's the starting point. I don't think unions themselves have a good enough handle on why the crisis is taking place and what the solutions are. And, they, and they, this, I, I hear so much empty moral, moralistic rhetoric, generally coming from unions, coming from the strike. You know, you know they're, they're bad people. The guy valet are bad. It doesn't wash unless you know, you're already a union supporter. Okay, so they're bad, who cares? I mean, everybody knows. I mean, everyone says to themselves, well, if I owned LA, I'd do the same thing. So then I'd be bad. Like when it becomes this moral argument, nobody, it doesn't persuade anybody anything. And the unions rely so much on the, you know, we're good guys and they're bad guys. And we have to explain the economic crisis. We, people have to really understand why this recession's taking place. 
and, and people have to use this language because they seem the, the unions and their, their politicians that are supposed to be affiliated with the unions, they're so timid to be kind, to use the word timid, to talk about class and talk about how deliberately aggressive these policies of keeping wages low are at the political level, never mind what happens at the company level. And if you talk the way I'm talking to say, oh, you want to wage class war, well, they are waging class war, and why don't we say so? Just they're conscious about it, and everybody else is sleepwalking. The union message needs to be, have a clarity connected with reality, because when it's moralistic, everybody says it's just the same old rhetoric. Like, the unions, I think, have three things they better fight on, and which we would like to report on. You know, one is, we're not going to pay for the consequences of the crisis, which involves that on the societal level issue of social spending, social security, health care, and all of that. Vis-a-vis -vis company, we ain't taking cutbacks and so on. Number two, organizing the unemployed, which I do hear next to nothing about in union movements in both countries. They just had Labor Notes Conference, you know, which is this sort of a lefty labor news thing that comes out of Detroit and New York, and they have a conference every year. And American trade unionists, much like the people here. And they didn't have, they have workshops, like all day long, workshop after workshop after workshop. And I said, how many you got on organizing the unemployed? Zero. Um, and then the other big issue is organizing the unorganized. Uh, I spoke at a CAW national convention a couple of, two, three years ago, and at the convention there's a big resolution on organizing the unemployed, uh, unorganized. And I said, by, same thing, by any objective news standard, if you guys actually go out and organize you know, hundreds of thousands of unemployed workers, that would be one of the biggest stories of the year. I mean, that would be socially transforming, which is news, if you have any news stand, real news standard. Well, you talk about uh, organizing the unorganized. Well, the people here won't be surprised, those that know me. The union needs to organize itself to start with, OK? because uh, everybody's got their own living room, their own little stories, but nobody's getting together. And I think in, in Canada, at least, we're, we're kind of missing the boat. We're uh, letting uh, the media telling all kind of bad story about the union, how they're sleeping all over the place. But I was in Jean Care working on the Walmart story, and the people are bad, uh, bashing us, the union, the people that try to keep that, uh, that, that store open. And the media is lying, so saying how how uh, th that, that store wasn't uh, bringing in any money, how they, but the real story, that place brought in a lot of money. Walmart came in with a, a Learjet loaded of accountants and uh, lawyers to tell everybody why they closed. As soon as the store closed, Walmart had this big advertisement how good they are buying locally, provincially, what they do good for Quebec. But the union, the one that spent millions to try to organize the, these people, has a result had two suicide, you know, in the community. Thousands of people lost their job. And after they organized these guys, where are they? You know, it's hard for me to go in the media in my region and say, come on, the union is there. So what I'm saying is that before we start organizing the unorganized, we, better, we need to get our act together. So. I mean, I, that, the reason I, said, I phrased what I said a little earlier in a very specific way, which is that fight about getting your act together, I think has to take place about something. It can't just be like, we're better than those guys. It's got to be about something. So it's about how are we going to organize the unorganized? How are we going to organize the unemployed? You know, how are, you know over specific issues, it's going to get fought out. But, but the story is what you're saying. It is the internal fight that's the real story. The other piece of it in terms of like a Walmart story and why we're doing what we're doing is the power of, of, of news is that it's daily. It's the repetition of it that's its power. It's like advertising, you know, it's, it's white, it's white, it's white. It's cleaner, it's cleaner, it's cleaner. It's when you hear that over and over and over again and that's what they do is they, they even if they had one decent story on this save Walmart, if, and I don't know that they did, it would get drowned out by the other 364 days a year of all the other crap. 
so what, this is really what we're trying to do here is create something that has, that's daily with the repetition of a news cycle. And it's not like what's going to happen just because we do this and then slowly everyone's going to say, oh, I see the light and the world changes. But what happens is there's certain moments in history that are so dramatic that they cut through the narrative of the mythology. So 9-11 was one of those moments. Uh, Katrina was one of those moments. There's just moments that are so dramatic that everybody stops and says, OK, my daily life, which normally consumes 99% of my consciousness, all of a sudden I know I'm getting that these big things affect me. And I better start worrying about these big things. And because most ordinary people, and it's not true for, you know, activists clearly are, you know, see the bigger picture and are trying to get involved in it. Most ordinary people are trying to get, survive every day and deal with their personal problems and kids and love life and everything else. But every so often these moments occur. So we need to be there in that moment. When people are flipping around a TV dial or looking on the internet and they're seeing the same, the same, the same, and they, then they get to us and they say, oh shit, did they just say that? That's what this model is about. We have to be there for the moments when we can, when we can start to penetrate a really ma mass consciousness. You talked about things we can talk to the general public about and, and get out and our messages from unions. What about trying to get a message out to our members? Um, because, I mean, there are unions, I think all of us are having trouble getting messages out to our, our rank and file members. Why? That's kind of the question. No, what I'm asking you, why? Because I'm not involved in it. Why are you having so much trouble? I'm not like, sure. There seems example? to be a lot of apathy. Um, people think that someone else is going to represent them and do all the work for them and they're going to benefit. Have you asked them why they're not listening? No. Why don't you start there? I mean, ask them why they're not listening. They're, I mean, maybe the message is tired. And, but I think it's, not, it's, I think it's, it's about What's holding the message back is the ideological, ideologically not breaking with this impotent role the unions are playing politically. If the unions can't really see themselves as an independent force, then it holds back all the thinking. And then it becomes tired slogans when people get talked to. And people have heard say, OK, I've already heard that. But the, the main thing is to get young workers going. I, I think as, as apathetic as probably some young people are, with a little bit of work, I bet you could turn into its opposite. Because as apathetic as young workers are, they're also bored with what they're doing. So if you can figure, you know, create a situation where it's invigorating to get involved, intellectually invigorating, challenging, and, and people can really feel like they're going to start growing intellectually. And think in terms of the society, not just in terms of our membership. The, uh, I mean, part of the reason this resentment comes from lower paid workers is the feeling that unions are just looking after themselves. I know that's not true, especially, it's more true in the US than it is here. Unions here have been a lot more involved in fighting for better social policy for everybody. There's more of that in Canada. Like UAW in, Can in the US is terrible. They didn't give a damn what happened to anyone that wasn't in the UAW. And it came back to bite them. I kind of want to know that two-tiered thing where if I volunteer, what, what is asked of me? And then also, like, where do you see your guys, um, your role in local media? There's a great need for local media, and there's a big debate about local media, but at the moment, we can't do anything about local media. I mean, local media in and of itself is not a great virtue if it's crap. So if it's just car chases and conventional coverage of city council and this and that, I personally wouldn't spend a minute fighting for it. That doesn't mean there doesn't need to be good local media. But right now, the, the issues, I think, that are facing us are primarily national. So that's what we're working at. That being said, we're going to do some experiments in a few places to try to combine the national issues with some local ones in some actual specific geographical areas as, as, exa as examples. But the volunteering and the local media and what we're doing connect this way for now. People can start real news chapters in their cities. They can do several things. One is they can join a blog squad to help us spread what we're doing. They, sh they, they look for local stories that will help people understand national issues. 
So find something in your workplace. Like I'm really juiced by the fact so many people here are from the public sector. The reason I am is I think the Canadian public sector has a lot to teach the world. With all its faults and everything, the public sector here, I think, every, most Canadians think, does a really good job. And it's a good model of how public ownership, public sector can work. Stuff that's working should also be a news story. Like, I actually think the LCBO should be a news story. I, I don't know if it's, it's a great story for Americans to hear. You know, they wanted to privatize it here, and they couldn't. The Ontarians didn't want to privatize it. And, I, and I've seen the comparisons between Alberta liquor stores that they privatized in Ontario. And you wouldn't want to go to an Alberta liquor store. You, you got, what is it, like a third of the choice you get here? Three, if you want to go another step and you got the time, we'll train you. If you're really interested, we'll train you how to shoot, we'll train you how to edit. And you can start learning how to produce stories. The other thing we want to do, which everybody can get involved with pretty quickly, is we want to have what we're calling people's editorial committees, where you invite some friends over to watch one of our stories, and then concretely tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, and very importantly, tell us what we should do next on this story. 